Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for uh, attending. Welcome to our home. Um, tonight, our first lecture will be on uh, my thoughts, will be as Yitzchak, our father as a parent. And what do we learn, what do we see from him and what he did? You know, the Torah tells us stories about the lives of the forefathers so that we can learn from their examples. In, in many ways, Yitzchak's approach to parenting really is a pristine example of how to deal with a child who may have taken a different path in life, one that does not follow that which God and his Torah commands us to do. Being a parent to a Yaakov was really simple, as the Torah states. The Yaakov was an Ishtam, a perfect individual, who dwelt in the tents of Torah. Yaakov was every parent's dream, a perfect child, a child who was a source of nachas, a pleasure to any parent. However, much like when the Torah describes the birth of Moshe, our teacher, <clears throat> the Torah does not mention the name of Moshe's parents, though they were both illustrious individuals, leaders of the generation. It only states in Exodus that a man from the house of Levi married a daughter of Levi. This description is telling us that Moshe could have been born to any parents, and he still would have been Moshe. The same can be said for Yaakov Avinu, for Jacob, our father. The true test of being a parent is having a child, not like a Yaakov, but like an Esau, a child that does not conform to your chosen lifestyle. God expects us to grow as individuals. Many times this growth comes about through our children, trying to help them make the right choices in life. As the saying goes, more than we bring up our children, we bring up ourselves. With nothing in the world as an accident, we have to know that God has given us our children for our benefit. They are a medium through which we are compelled to grow, to be, be, be a better person, to be greater than we might otherwise actually want to be. We may be lazy when it comes to our own growth, but not when it comes to the growth of our children. <clears throat> Excuse me, most parents are willing to push themselves beyond their comfort level for the benefit of their children. You know, Yitzchak understood that his true test in life was not bringing up a Yaakov. Uh, Yaakov was a refined individual. He was a tzaddik, a righteous individual with a tzaddik soul. As the Torah describes him again as an ish tam, a perfect individual. Esav, on the other hand, <laughs> was far from perfect. He was an earthy person. He was a man of the world, charismatic, a smooth talker. He knew what to say and how to phrase his questions so as to be able to influence people and impress them with his personality, though it wasn't always genuine. And even though the Torah states that Esav was Ish Yodea Tzayed, a man who was a cunning hunter, I believe these words are also referring to Yitzhak, his father. Yitzhak was able to bring Esav closer instead of pushing him away. How? By being resourceful. In fact, the Talmud tells us that we learn how best to fill the mitzvah <clears throat> of honoring a parent from Esau. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, even though they were not of the same mind, Yitzchak was able to cultivate in Esau love rather than animosity. Yitzchak understood that his true challenge in life was bringing up an Esau. Yitzchak changed his nature he was a Baal Gavura, a, a tough, no-nonsense individual, and yet he took on the guise of a gentle, blind, and loving parent. Everything he did with Esau was against his nature. He was patient, loving, and understanding. And based on his nature, one would have thought that he would have driven an Esau from his house, much like Avinu, Abraham did with Yishmoel. Whenever we, he thought of that arguing with Esau would be an exercise in futility? Yitzchak said nothing. He acted as if he didn't see. He understood that confronting his eldest son would only drive him away. As an example, <clears throat> Esau's first two wives were from the Chitim, a nation that had been cursed by God. Though Yitzchak could not have been happy with Esau's choices of wives, nowhere, nowhere does the Torah record his disapproval. 
You know, Yitzchak found ways of using Esau's talents as a way for the two of them to find common ground. Esau was a hunter. He would feed his father with the game that he would trap. This brought about a sense of joy and love to both of them. However, we know that Yitzchak was a wealthy man in his own right. He really didn't need his eldest son to feed him. However, he saw it as a way for the two of them to connect. As we read, Yitzchak asked Esau to hunt and bring him a meal that he would enjoy so that he could bless him. But was it, was it Tzaddik on the level of Yitzchak really interested in food? I think not. It was just a way for him to bond with his son, Esau. In addition, it was a way for Esau to earn the merit of <clears throat> Kibbut of the Aim by honoring his father. And in that merit, Yitzchak would be able to bless him with the consent of heaven. Yitzhak understood that confronting an Esau about his lifestyle and his choices would be counterproductive. Yet we see that Esau does marry a third wife, and this time, from the family of Yishmoel. But why? Yitzhak made sure that Esau was present when he told Yaakov, do not marry a Canaanite girl, since it was said to his brother Yaakov, and not to him directly, Esau actually listened and followed his father's indirect request. As my kids were growing up, they used to play around and act as if they were me. And then they would parrot answers to questions about Judaism that I would say. And they did enjoy those moments. It happened the one time my daughter brought home a Jewish girlfriend from a secular high school. It was just before the holiday of Sukkot. <clears throat> and the two of them were helping me as I was putting up my sukkah. As we were working, I was telling a friend about the holiday of Sukkot and other facts about Judaism. You know, when a friend left, my daughter turned to me and said, Dad, that was great. I really enjoyed hearing what you told her. <laughs> well, I just started to laugh. She said, no, 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 I, I, I really mean it. I said to her, you hear those things all the time. In fact, you and your brother even chide me about my answers. She agreed. But she said, you know, somehow it sounded different when you were talking to someone else. Every lock has a key, and as parents, we have to find the right key for all of our children. Not every key works for every child. Every child is unique. Yitzhak understood Esau's personality. <clears throat> and he knew how and when to push, but also want to be best not to give his eldest son any advice at all. The Torah tells us that Yitzchak wants to bless Esau, his eldest son, before his death. So he tells Esau to go out and hunt and to make him some food that he enjoyed. With the enjoyment of the food and in the merit of the mitzvah of honoring his father, Yitzchak intended to bless his eldest son. Now, both of these facts would place him in a positive frame of mind, which would allow him, Yitzchak, to bless Esau with the consent of the Shekhinah, with the divinity of God. Now Rivka, hearing what Yitzchak intended to do, decided that the blessing would be best suited to her younger son, Yaakov. So she takes matters into her own hands. She cooks food and dresses Yaakov up in Esau's clothing. Well, she even goes so far as to put goat's hair on Yaakov's arm since Esau was a hairy individual. All of this so that Yitzchak, who was blind, would bless Yaakov, thinking that he was Esau. Her plan works. And Yitzchak gives the blessing to Yaakov, thinking that he was Esau. When Esau comes back from the hunt, he brings the food to his father, only to find out that his younger brother had already taken the blessing that was meant for him. He cries bitterly and says to his father, Don't you have another blessing? So Yitzchak does find the words to bless his firstborn son. So let's look at the wording of the blessing, and we may see and learn some deeper meanings into his words. But, but before we look at the blessing that Yitzchak gives to Esau, let us look into a story found in the Talmud, in Moed Katan. The Talmud there tells us about a Reb Shimon Bar Yechoi. He had sent his son, Reb Elazar, to a couple of distinguished sages for a blessing. When his son returned, he said the sages did say words to him, but they didn't sound much like blessings. He told his father exactly what they said. 
And I quote, May it be his will that you sow and not reap, that you bring in and not let out, that you invest and not have a return, that your house be destroyed and your inn settled, and that your table be confused and you should not see a new year. He was shocked. He had gone to the sages for a blessing and instead, <laughs> instead they cursed him. His father smiled and said to him, all their words are really blessings. His father began to explain. Sow and not reap means that you will have children who will not die in your lifetime. Bring in and not let out means that you will bring in daughter-in-laws and your children will, that your children will marry and your sons who marry them will not die in their lifetimes. Invest and not have a return means that your daughters will marry and that their husbands will not die, resulting in your daughters not having to return home. Your house be destroyed and your inn settled means that your grave, which is called a house, will not come to use and you will live long years in this world, which is compared to an inn. And that your table should be confused with many sons and daughters. And you should not see a new year means that your wife will not die and you will therefore not have to see a new year, meaning remarry and spend the first year with a new wife. His son asked his father, well, why didn't they just bless me in simple language? His father explained that the side of evil often tries to interfere with their blessings in this world. So what they try to do is outsmart the forces of evil by clothing their words in terms that might seem a bit offensive. So a blessing disguised as a curse is much easier to smuggle, so to speak, past the forces of judgment. We see the opposite scenario in the Torah with Bilaam. When he blesses the Jewish nation in the desert, he closes curses in words of blessings. So how does this all connect to Yitzhak and the blessing he gave to his eldest son, Asa? Let us look at the wording of the blessing found in the book of Genesis in the portions of Toldos. There it states, It translates to mean, and by your sword you shall live and your brother you shall serve. Uh, it's a very strange blessing from a righteous individual like Yitzchak. Why would he bless his son that he loved to be a murderer? And then tell him that he would serve his brother. That could not have made Asaph happy at all. So let us look deeper into these words and see what we find. What was Yitzchak trying to accomplish? He wanted the best for his earthy son. But he knew full well that it was only so much that he could tell Asaph or that Asaph would accept. So like any loving parent, he hoped for the best and concealed his hopes and wishes in these words. Vial, the word al connects to the word aliyah, an ascent. Yitzchak hoped that his son would ascend in a spiritual sense. Charbacha, which is spelled chet, resh, bet, chaf. The Torah give, what was given to the Jewish nation on Mount Sinai. Another name for the mountain is Mount Chorev. Again, the word is, word is spelled a chet, resh, and a bet. These letters are an acronym for the words chesed, rachamim, and busha, kindness, mercy, and modesty. The Talmud tells us that if a Jew does not possess these three traits, that he is most likely descended from the Erev Rab, the mixed multitude, those Egyptian converts that Moshe brought out of Egypt with the children of Israel when they were redeemed. And the chaf, the last letter of Charbacha means you. So Yitzhak was praying that his beloved son would be elevated and find the proper path of a Jew with the traits of kindness, mercy, and modesty. And then you, you, not just your brother. His hidden blessing continues with that when Yaakov's descendants drop the ball, you should pick it up and you should be the leader. And then Tichya, future tense that then you will succeed in having a good life in this world and also in the next. You know, this week I was listening to a lecture on YouTube by Rabbi Y.Y. Jacobson. And in the lecture, he quoted a Rabbi Moshe David Vali, who lived in the 16th century. On the words in the blessing that states, as harbucha tavo, and your brother you will serve, he interprets these words as a prophecy that in the future, Esau's descendants, represented by the Roman Empire, would serve his brother, a Jew, 
Jesus of Nazareth. Rabbi Beryl Wein, a noted Jewish historian, stated that 10% of the Roman Empire was Jewish. Many more people would have converted to Jewsian, except for the fact that circumcision was seen at this time in history as a mutilation of the human body. So Christianity came along, and it was Judaism without circumcision. Christianity became the national religion of Rome, a descendant of Asa. In fact, for the first 150 years of Christianity, they kept the Shabbat instead of Sunday as their day of rest. So Yitzchak clothed blessing to his eldest son was that he should live within the laws of the Torah given at Mount Horeb. This blessing was realized again and again with righteous converts and scholars that came from Esau, such as Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir, Unculus, Shemaiah, Avtalian, leaders of their generations, and many, many others throughout the generations. However, Yitzhak was a realist. He accepted the fact that he would not be able to totally change an Esau, nor his descendants. But he hoped to at least diminish their culpability. If a lawyer has a client who has committed murder and there are witnesses to the act, his client would be facing a death penalty. Imagine if the lawyer were able to get his client off with 20 to 40 year sentence. That verdict would be a big win for the defense, even though his client was found guilty and would have to spend time in prison. Yitzhak understood that Ace of Descendants would most likely travel a godless path, following after idol worshippers of the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. So he prayed that they at least serve his brother, meaning in the form of Christianity, and in this way save them from the worst sin that one can commit, which is idol worship. Today, there are 2.5 billion Christians in the world, many of whom reflect the traits that God commands in his Torah. This is a direct connection to Yitzchak and the result of the blessing that he gave to his eldest son, Esau. You know, there's a debate among the sages as to whether Christianity is idol worship or not. The Rambam's opinion is that it is a form of idol worship. But he adds, given the two options, better a Gentile serves God as a Christian than, God, than serve God as an idol worshiper. The Rambam writes in Hilchus Malachim, The Laws of Kings, in chapter 11, in the middle of the fourth paragraph, Referring to Christianity, he says, ultimately, all the deeds of Jesus of Nazareth will only serve to prepare the way for Messiah's coming and the improvement of the entire world, motivating the nations to serve God together. These are words that Yitzchak could not say openly to Esau. But as a loving father, he could disguise them in words that Esau would accept. Many of us as living parents have hopes and dreams that we wish for our children. Many of these thoughts we cannot express openly into words, but they still exist in the recesses of our hearts. So too God Almighty, our Father in Heaven, has dreams and aspirations for us. And let us hope that we can at least attempt to attain some degree of success in this world and give Him some pleasure. And with that, may we herald in the coming Mashiach Zikane quickly and in our time. I want to thank you all for listening. Have a great week. Uh, stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe, and God should bless you only with good. Thank you again.